trips. Anybody else do a lot of road trips when you were growing up? Uh, we did. There were four of us under the age of five, uh, so you didn't want to bring that on an airplane, right? And mom didn't really like to fly. And so we would do a lot of road trips uh, growing up, and, and I have a lot of fond memories of my dad, but the ones from the road trips aren't the fondest. I'm just going to be honest. Uh, we lived here in Charleston for most of our childhood, and we would drive to places like Houston, Texas, or Denver, Colorado. That's a lot of time spent in a car. And usually about the time we would get to Georgia, uh, you would start to see like a situation in the back seat would start small, but it would escalate into a, a fight. And then you would just see a, a hand. He would always keep one hand on the steering wheel, but then an arm would start swinging back to the back. Like if you don't stop, you know, anybody else ever experienced that? Don't try to deny it, dad. Swinging back and, you know, ah, and then eventually they would say this, right? Don't make me pull the car over. If you do this one more time, I will pull this car over, and you don't want to know what's going to happen when I do. We did happen to have that happen a couple of times, and it's not appropriate at church to share what happens when the car gets pulled over, but, but it happened, right? And, and, and as a dad, you can just relate to that, getting frustrated. And, well, we're in a series right now, and we're studying the life of Jesus. It's called Walking Away from Jesus. Not that we want you to walk away from Jesus, but as we walk away from interactions with Jesus, what's different about us? And Jesus didn't have biological kids, but what Jesus did have was spiritual kids. He had 12 disciples that he was raising up, that he was investing in and he was pouring into. And the story that I wanna to talk to you about today for a few minutes is a story where Jesus basically looks back and swats his hand and says, no more of this. Don't make me pull this donkey over uh, with his disciples. He has this moment with them that he gets frustrated. And, and it's, it happens, it's actually the last conversation that he has with them before he goes to the cross uh, at Calvary. And, and they're in a place called the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a beautiful place. It looks out over across a little valley into Jerusalem. It's the middle of the night, and Jesus knows what's getting ready to happen. He's praying. He's asking his disciples to stay up and to pray with him, and they keep on falling asleep. And it's in one of those conversations that he's having with his disciples about, hey, would you, would you stay awake with me? Would you pray with me? That we find the story that I want us to look at today. Luke chapter 22, verses 47 through 51. By the way, this story is told in all four of the gospels, which just tells you it left a real mark on, on, the, on, the, on the disciples. They, they remembered it. They wanted to make sure that we heard about it. And it says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. Judas is, of course, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus who has now turned his back on him and is betraying him. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. Again, I imagine Jesus, if he was on a road trip, he's, stop, no more, don't make me pull this car over, right? No more of this, no more. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Such an interesting passage of scripture. Immediately following that, they took Jesus, they arrested him, and the disciples scattered. They disappeared. They went their separate ways. And as I was reading this story this week, I, I imagine that at some point they obviously come back together. And I imagine they have a conversation. No more of what? I mean, Jesus, you know, we think of him as this, you know, loving and he is loving, but, but he has these moments of just strong words to the disciples. No more of what? What did he mean? No more of this. And on this Father's Day weekend, what I want us to do is look back into the story. And I think we can see three things that if Jesus were here today and he were talking to us, definitely the men and the fathers, but all of us, he'd say, hey, guys, no more of this. No more of this. The first thing I think he would say is no more taking matters into your own hands. No more. No more taking matters into your own hands. Verse 49, when Jesus' followers saw what was gonna happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? 
Listen, kudos to the followers. They prayed. They stopped. God, what should we do in this situation? That's, that's what we want you to do. Add a boy. <laughs> but then they did what so often we do. Jesus was a little slow on the answer. Have you guys ever prayed and, and God was a little slow on his answer? <laughs> and so they did, one of them did, what many of us do is he just took matters into his own hands. Hey, Jesus, do you want me to, to strike him with a sword? And, and instead of waiting for an answer from Jesus, he picks up his sword and he goes and he strikes. And so often, that's what I end up doing, not striking people with a sword, but striking people with my words or striking people with a, a post, striking. God, I, my heart's right. God, I'm asking you for your wisdom. But, but so often, we're really just wanting him to confirm what we've already decided that we're gonna do. We really just want him to, to make us feel better about what we're already planning on doing anyways. We take matters into our own hands. I know it's so like us, especially me, to try to fix things without waiting on God. You know, we pray to him, we plead with him, we tell ourselves that we're trusting him, and, and, and then we soon decide that we need to solve the problem, whatever it might be, on our own. We take on tasks that we should leave for others. We say something that, that should have been left unsaid. We play God instead of letting God work out his perfect plan. You know, there are a lot of stories in scripture that, that people take matters into their own hands. The one that stood out to me, me the most this week is the story of Abraham and Sarah. You guys remember that story? They knew God's will. He had told them, you're gonna be the father of many nations. I'm gonna bless you with descendants, with children. But, but all the while, they're struggling with infertility. The plan that they knew God had given them, it's not coming in to, to, to play. And, and, and so they pray and they ask God, but, but then they decide, I'm gonna take matters into my own hands. And Sarah says to Abraham, maybe there's something wrong with me. Why don't you take my, my, my concubine, my maidservant, and let's do this a different way. Take matters into their own hands. And out of that is born a son named Ishmael. And then eventually they did it the right way and had their son Isaac. And guess what? There are wars that are still being fought today between the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac because of them taking matters into their own hands. You know, Ishmael is God's will done my way. It's when I, I do God's will, but I do it my own way. And, and so often we do it. We know his will, but we get tired of waiting for his direction, for his guidance. I love Isaiah 40, 31. It says, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And we want that, right? We wanna run and not be weary. We wanna mount up with wings like eagles. But the beginning of that verse says, it's those that, that wait, that trust, that don't take matters into their own hands, don't try to solve things on their own, but genuinely trust God. Because at the end of the day, as much as I would like to think I know what's best in most circumstances, I don't. I'm not God, and neither are you. In fact, Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As they're sitting there in the Garden of Gethsemane, it seemed very obvious to Peter, who is the disciple that cut off his ear, what the right way was. But Jesus was, was at work in a different way. And so, so what about you? What area of your life are you trying to take matters into your own hands right now? Is there, is there something that maybe you know what God's word says, but you've been doing it your way? I believe Jesus would say, hey, no more of this. No more of this. This isn't helping you. It's, it's, it's not serving people. It's just no more. Stop trying to take matters into your own hands. And I know as guys especially, we struggle with this, right? And we want to fix things. We want to get, get it right. But Jesus would say, hey, no more of this. The other thing I think that Jesus would say no more of is no more reacting in anger. No more. No more reacting in anger. Now, I, I told you that we know the disciple that did this is Peter. How do we know that? In three out of the four gospels, they don't give us the name, 
But John, who was kind of always in competition with Peter, he, he rats him out. I imagine they had talked and said, hey, let's leave that detail out of the story. It's not important. The people don't need it. Uh, followers of Christ for all of eternity don't need to know. And then John writes his letter and says, ah, by the way, it was Peter. It was Peter. And so we love to give Peter a hard time, right? It's so like him. He's that disciple that's always putting his, his, his foot in his mouth or saying things he shouldn't say, doing things he shouldn't do. But I want you to think about this moment for a minute. They're, they're, they're there in the garden, and Judas, this is his friend. They've been doing life together for years, shows up, and they're going to take Jesus, whom he has put all of his trust in. He's completely sold out to the message of Jesus, and they're getting ready to take him and crucify him and kill him. He had righteous anger, and this guy, the high priest that's come to him, is very likely one of the people that that corrupted Judas, that probably took the money and gave the money to Judas that Judas had received to sell out Jesus. And he is angry. It's righteous anger. He should be mad. But how many of you know, just because there's righteous anger, it doesn't justify unrighteous actions. And Peter is mad and he should be mad. But what he does with that is unhealthy. Have any of you ever had righteous anger but an unrighteous response to it? Come on. It's church. We can be honest. Okay. Okay. It happened to me not long ago. It's going to be confession time with, with the church here with me. I told you I had COVID a couple months ago and, uh, and got really sick, was hospitalized with it. And I got out of the hospital and there was just something about uh, seeing a glimpse of your own mortality that is clarifying for you in some really good ways. But I also had a bit of an edge that may not have been uh, in the best ways. I'm a pretty mild mild-tempered guy. I don't lose, lose it much. And, but, but following that stint in the hospital, I found myself a little bit on edge. And I decided to play golf about five or six days after I got out of the hospital. I was feeling better, felt that the Lord's will for me was to go to the golf course. And I did. And I'm not a very good golfer. I was playing with my brother, Jason, and my brother-in-law, Josh Ray. And it was a slow day. Uh, we had a twosome that was in front of us, and there was a foursome that was in front of them. And so it was playing real slow. Not a big deal, though. We were enjoying it. Finally, on the 17th hole, that twosome played through the foursome, and so now we're behind this foursome. And so I get up on the 18th hole. They're on ahead of us on the fairway, uh, up closer to the green. I don't hit the ball very far. I, like I said, I'm a bad golfer, so I get up. I play ready golf. I'm the first one to go. And on this particular case, I hit the ball, and I hit it really good, straight down the fairway, and, um, and, and better than I normally do, still about 30 yards behind the group in front of us. But this guy turns around after the ball lands. He hears it behind him, and he looks back, and he starts yelling, and he throws his hands up in the air. And I was like, is, is he mad at me? And Jason was like, I think so. I was like, I think, I mean, I've never hit into anybody in my life. That felt pretty good. Maybe I hit into him, but, but it was still, it was 30 yards back. So I just ignored him. Well, then he gets in his golf cart, and he drives his golf cart 30 yards back to my ball, and he picks up my ball off of the fairway. Like, it was a new ball, Bridgestone. I had just put one in the water on the last hole. It was a brand new golf ball. And this may be very well the golf ball that has solved all of my problems because I hit it really well. So he picks it up. And, and, and so I said, guys, I'll be right back. And I got in my golf cart and I drove up the fairway and I found these guys up near the green. And I, I, I'm driving up there and I'm just so angry. Why did they do that? And I'm thinking, what are you doing? I'm thinking, no, this is right. Somebody needs to correct these guys. And so I go up. I mean, they could be stealing golf balls all over this golf court if I, if I don't deal with this, right? And so I said, hey, did somebody take my golf ball? And he looks back and he says, yeah, I did. You've been hitting into me all day long. And I was like, okay, three, three problems with that, bro. Number one, I can't hit the ball 175 yards on my best day. I just am a bad golfer. Number two, we haven't been playing behind you all day long. This is the first hole that we've been behind you. Number three, if I don't if I saw it correctly, you got in your golf cart and drove backwards 30 yards to pick up my golf ball. What kind of insecurity does it take for a guy to think I'm hitting into you when it's 30 yards behind you? What are you doing? I just came. I didn't come to fight, but I need my golf ball back. And he said, I threw it in the marsh. I'm telling you what, I'm not going to tell you what I did next, but I did come back with a golf ball. Uh, and I didn't fight the guy, all right? I didn't fight the guy, but I was just mad. I was, he shouldn't, he shouldn't have done that. And so, so I, I, I feel pretty good about that. My brother had driven up to, to give me backup, and, and I, got, I got what I needed, and, 
and we finish. And so I call my wife on the way home and, and I'm talking to her and I, I tell her this story. I'm like, you're not going to believe what happened. And this is what I did. And she's like, Josh, what is wrong with you? You were in the paper a week ago for almost dying of COVID. Now you're going to be in the paper for getting a fight on the golf course. And I'm like, well, babe, he took my golf ball. And she said, well, well, what if he goes to Seacoast? I said, well, then he needs to go somewhere else. It's not working. And, and so I got, I got a golf ball. Okay, stop clapping. This is not good. This is confession time. I had righteous anger, but my actions and my words were not, were not righteous. And so if you're here today uh, and, and you are that guy, I apologize for what I said to you and the people that were with you. But, but so, so often we do that, right? We're mad. We're mad. What do we do with it, though? Like, it's okay to be mad, but I think if Jesus were here today, he'd go, Josh, no more, no more of that. That's not a good reflection of me. And, and I don't know, especially, again, the guys, if you can relate to, to being angry, but, but, but wanting, to, wanting to handle that in a healthy way. Peter was, was angry. He should have been angry. What do we do? I'm not a big fan of, like, formulaic Christianity, three simple steps to your best life now, but, but there are three steps that Jesus' brother, James, gave us in the book of James on how do we handle our anger. Here's what he says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, say everyone with me, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Real, real quick, let's break that down. Quick to listen. Are you quick to listen when, when you get upset? I know I, I'm not. I'm, I'm a parent. I've got three kids in the home, and, and there are often times that I see them do something, their behavior doesn't line up with what I know we're teaching them, what I know we're trying to instill in them. And so the first thing that I, I tend to do when I get mad at my kids is say something. I get angry and say something. I do the opposite. Quick to get angry. I'm going to tell you why I'm mad. And maybe I'll give you a chance to speak your piece, but most likely I won't. Go to your room. Right? That that's, tends to be my formula. But, but man, when I get it right, when I take the moment to go, okay, I'm going to try to figure, I'm going to be quick to listen. Because how many of you know as parents, our goal isn't just behavior modification, we don't just want them doing the right things. We want their heart. And if we'll be quick to listen, usually we will discover that there's something going on a little bit deeper than just the bad behavior. And if we'll take a moment to assume that we don't know everything about the situation, let's ask a couple of questions. We'll get to their heart. We'll figure out that maybe there's something deeper going on. Not all the time. We don't always get there, but often we do. And man, when we get to the heart, that's parenting. That we can parent the heart, not just their behavior. Be quick to listen. Next time you get upset with your kids, maybe take a moment. What's going on, son? Hey, what, what, tell me why you responded in that way and see if you don't learn a little something different. Slow to speak. Man, I know in my marriage, I have many testimonies of getting that one wrong. You know, sometimes I'll walk into the house or I'll show up and I'll know immediately that I have done something that I shouldn't have done and I'm not exactly sure what it is. Are there any other, don't raise your hand on that one. Just, we know, we get it, right? And so if you've ever been in premarital counseling with me, you know, I teach the 10 second rule. Just take 10 seconds before you say what you, what you want to say. I'll usually know what I want to say. And it, it usually is something like this. Obviously I did something wrong. You're mad again. What's going on? How I many you know that conversation doesn't go in a real positive direction? And so I take the 10 seconds, and here's my, my question in my mind, is how do I want this conversation to go? And if I, if I will give myself 10 seconds, pray, how do I want this conversation to go? Usually, I'll come in with something like this. Hey, babe, I can tell something's bothering you. Do you want to talk about it? How many of you know those are two very different conversations? That 10 seconds saved me about a day and a half of fighting when I take it, when I'm slow to speak. And it's not just about that, but it's about often our, our initial reaction, especially if you're gifted uh, like I am with words and sarcasm, uh, is going to, it's going to cut. It's, gonna, it's not going to be what you want to say. It's not going to take you where you want to go. So we're going to be slow to speak. We're going to be quick to listen. And if we'll do that, usually we'll be a little bit slower to get angry. 
And, and so I wanna encourage those of you today that maybe are dealing with anger. What, what, what is that thing that has got you angry? And again, it might be righteous anger. Maybe you're angry about our country. Maybe the direction, the moral decay of our country. That's righteous anger. Maybe you're angry about an issue of injustice in our country. And, and man, that's righteous anger, but, but righteous anger doesn't justify unrighteous responses. The way that we speak to others, the way that we post to social media. Let's be quick to listen. Just assume that you don't know all there is to know about the issue. Slow to speak, slow to post, and it'll help us to become slow to get angry. You know, Peter was mad, but he was mad at the wrong thing. Jesus was angry too. For Peter, the anger was this, this person, this servant of the high priest, Judas, the, the, the system, right? But Jesus understood that the battle that we fight is not flesh and blood, that we do have an enemy, but it's not the person that's made you mad. It's not the, 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 the wife or the kid. It's that there is a battle going on. If we'll learn to channel that, that anger in the right way, like Jesus did, he was getting ready to go deal with it. He was getting ready to go deal with sin once and for all on the cross. So I think he would tell us, hey, no more. No more reacting out of anger. No more taking matters into your own hands. Third thing for me is I think he would tell us, no more cutting off the world's ability to hear Jesus. I think you would say, hey, Seacoast, hey, church, you've got to stop cutting off the people that I'm actually trying to heal, that I'm trying to reach. But because of interactions that they're having with you, you're cutting off their ability to hear me and see me rightly. It's interesting to me, John's version of the story gives us one more detail that none of the other versions give. He says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, so again, he, he sold out his friend, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And then he tells us his name. The servant's name was Malchus. The servant's name was Malchus. Why would he give us that detail? Why would he give us that detail? Likely it means that he went and sourced it. He probably went and talked to Malchus later. But how many of you know words matter? Meanings of words matter in the Bible especially. And the word Malchus is a Greek word and it translates to kings or kingdoms. Essentially this guy represented the kingdoms of the world. And Peter literally took a sword and cut off the ear of kingdoms so that they couldn't, he couldn't hear Jesus. And so often, I believe the church, often out of righteous anger but unrighteous responses, we cut off the ability for the world to be able to hear Jesus. I know if I were to interview many of you here today, you would say, yeah, I've been hurt by somebody who was in the church who was supposed to be representing Jesus, but they, they cut me with their words or they cut me with their actions or they cut me with their exclusion of me. And it hurt. And Jesus says, Peter, stop. No more of this. And he leans down and he heals this guy's ear and he restores his ability to hear. You know, I was talking with, Pastor Chip Judd about this this week, and he said he probably sees four or five people a week that part of their challenges, part of their issues, he's a counselor, are related to being wounded by the church. And as I looked into this story, I see two people, Peter, who's got church hurt, right? Malchus is the representative of the high priest. He's supposed to be leading this thing. He's supposed to be pastoring. He's supposed to be serving, but now they're coming and they're betraying and they're hurting us. And so he responds in anger. But then you think about Malchus. He has this interaction with a follower of Christ that's not very pleasant, to say the least. And both of them, out of their wounds, are hurting each other. And I think Jesus would say, hey, no more of this. No more of this. Stop. Stop. I'm actually, I'm fighting the enemy. I fought the enemy. Stop weaponizing your your, your values stop operating out of, of church hurt and hurting people that I came to heal. And so my question for you would be this. Does your attitude and action 
open people's ears or close people's ears. I don't know what you're mad about. I don't know what maybe issue you're dealing with, but at the end of the day, in light of what Jesus has called us to do, it's a golf ball. It's a golf ball. Is it worth it? Is the way that we're hurting people, we're shouting at people, we're yelling at people, is it worth it to take their ability to hear from Jesus over a golf ball? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna challenge, especially us men, let's, let's model this, let's live this. Again, it's okay to get mad from time to time, but let's be slow to speak, quick to listen and respond in partnership with Jesus so that he's not having to come behind us and clean up our messes, but we actually can extend the healing hands of Jesus in a way that would, would show the world who he is. Man, I, I'll tell you what, my prayer for Seacoast, my prayer for us, men, women, whoever that's here today, is that more times than not, we would be attentive to the spirit and we would be those healing hands for the people. That this place, it's been a house of healing in so many different ways, physical, emotional, but that, that our small groups, our interactions would be places of healing for people, even those that have church hurt because we respond differently because we partner with Jesus rather than, than move in ways that he has to say, hey, no more of this. And so church, no more. No more taking matters into our own hands. There's freedom in that. You don't have to figure it all out on your own. Jesus didn't need Peter to be his savior. He was fully capable of it himself. No more reacting in anger. And let's be a church, let's be a people that make it easy for people to see Jesus rather than making it hard. Would you guys pray with me as we close? Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you even for the more challenging instruction, the no more of this words. And I just pray, God, that you would help us. Lord, as your church, we know that we have the tendency, Lord, to, to say things, to react in ways that might make it difficult for people to see who you really are, to see your love, your healing power that is at work. And so first of all, God, we just repent. We just say, God, we're sorry for the times that we have made it hard for people to hear you and see you. God, I pray for the people that are here today. Maybe they do carry wounds from maybe a father, maybe from church people that have responded to them and inappropriate ways, maybe even with rightful anger, but have responded inappropriately. And I pray, Lord, that today as we worship in response time, just like you leaned down and healed Malchus's ear, that you would lean down and you would bring healing in our hearts, that you would bring healing in our lives. And God, I pray for every man that's here today, every father, Lord, that's here or at our campuses or watching online. I just pray, God, that you would give us a fresh fire, a fresh anointing to live this out well, to be that model, that role model that, that people see us and they see a picture of who you are, Jesus. And that when we fall short, God, that you would, like, the, like your word says in Proverbs, though the righteous fall seven times, they get up again. And for many of us, I pray that today would be a day that we get back up again and we begin to walk out the plans and purposes that you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.